Carbon element is one of the most important elements in nature, and you can find it in different forms like diamond, fullerene, carbon nanotube, or graphite, which are allotropes of carbon. But if you somehow make a single layer of carbon atoms arranged in a two-dimensional honeycomb lattice, you would have another allotrope of carbon called graphene. We know that the properties of a material are directly related to the chemical structures and their functional groups, and we know that the graphene is highly hydrophobic and poorly dispersible in water, so its biological applications are limited. However, we can always modify these properties by engineering the material. For example, we can add functional groups containing oxygen such as carbonyl, carboxyl, epoxide, and hydroxyl. In the situation, we call these structures graphene oxide, which open the door for carbon materials to be used in biological systems. This article is one of the first studies that introduced graphene-based material into the biomedical field in 2008. They used graphene oxide as an efficient carrier for the delivery of anti-cancer drugs, in this video, I'm going to talk about how exactly they did that. First, they synthesized graphene oxide. One of the most popular ways is Hummer's method, in which we dissolve graphite in sulfuric acid and nitric acid, and then we add potassium permanganate, which is a very strong oxidizing agent. Afterward, the reaction should be diluted with water, which produces a high amount of heat. So we should keep the temperature low with ice, otherwise it would be really dangerous. Finally, hydrogen peroxide should be added, which removes the excessive potassium permanganate to end the reaction. In contrast to graphene, graphene oxide shows great solubility in water, but if you want to inject this material into the body, we should check them in plasma and serum. So they observed that the graphene oxide aggregates in these environments, which is probably caused by the presence of salts and protein in plasma. We observe this aggregation most of the time when we want to introduce biomaterials or some drugs to a biological system. The most common solution to this problem is what we call pegylation, which means we add polyethylene glycol or PEG to the surface of our graphene oxide. This would typically slow down their aggregation and degradation as well as elimination by kidneys, which increases the circulation time in the body. Plus, the covalent attachment of PEG to a material can mask the agent from the host immune system as well. So how do the others functionalize their graphene oxide with PEG? Actually, it is a very popular chemical reaction that we can use to make a covalent bond between any two substances. One should have an amine functional group and the other should have a carboxyl group. In this situation, we add two substances, the EDC and NHS. These two substances activate the carboxyl groups and make a covalent amide bond. Our graphene oxide already contains carboxyl groups on the surface, and they use a star-shaped PEG, which has a primary amine group on each arm. So after adding the EDC NHS to the graphene oxide and PEG solution, they bind to each other. Now we should bind the drug to our system. One of the problems with some of the drugs is that they are hydrophobic, and the biological system is mostly made out of water, and since they can mix together, their application are quite limited. One solution is to bind a drug to a more hydrophilic material like graphene oxide. In this article, they went for a hydrophobic drug called SN38, which is used in the treatment of colon cancer and a small cell lung cancer. They found that the simple mixing with graphene oxide could result in the attachment of the drug. However, they suggested that the binding of SN38 onto graphene oxide was non-covalent, driven by hydrophobic interactions and pi pi stacking. After making the engineered drug, it's time to test its toxicity towards cancerous cells. In the study, they used a human colon cancer cell line. For assessing cell toxicity, we often use a simple method called MTT assay, and the results would be something like this. You have a drug concentration on the x-axis, and the percentage of the living cells has shown on the y-axis. So if the graph goes downwards as you increase the concentration of the drug, it would kill more cancerous cells. So it would be more effective. These graphs belong to the free SN38 and the SN38 that binds to the pegylated graphene oxide, which shows that the drug is a little more effective, but behaves in the same way compared to the free drug. However, the biomaterial should not be toxic and safe in those concentrations. This is the comparison between the toxicity of pegylated graphene oxide without and with the drug, which shows that this drug delivery system is not toxic to the cells. By the way, they used a variety of other tests, which I'm not going to explain, but if you want to see them, you can find the articles link in the description below. 